This is Comic Geek Speak, episode 63. Welcome to Comic Geek Speak, brought to you in conjunction with WorldFamousComics.com. Your spot on the internet for the best comic book and entertainment related columns, contests, features, renew, reviews, news, resources, and more. I'm Brian Deemer. I'm Tasha Deemer. I'm Shane Kelly. I'm Jamie D. I'm Peter Rios. We are sexy bitches, yeah! <laughs> We're creating new words, too. Yes, right. If it's a reviewing renews. and news, it's renews. <laughs> uh, yeah, you're funny. <laughs> oh yeah, because it's not me. That's that's why it's funny. So how's everyone doing here tonight? Yeah, Peter, Great. you can't just shake your head because the audience can't see you. This is not right. a visual medium. Peachy good. Not bad. All right. How well, you feel? Okay. That's a good show. Okay. okay. <laughs> Very good. We all just ate, so we're kind of like... Uh, we know. We actually know exactly what we're going to do. We're just, yeah, we're just, for some reason, no how to get there. <laughs> kicked in high gear yet. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> well, we got plans, so we should start. We should start. Yeah. So we're, what we're going to talk about for the first part of the show is Top Shelf Productions and some of their comics. They uh, sent us a goodie box full of stuff. Let's see what we got here. We got uh, A-E-I-O-U by Jeffrey Brown. Uh, it's called An Easy Intimacy. We got The King by Rich Kozlowski. Got issue one of The Surrogates by Robert Venditti and Brett uh, Weldell. We got Spiral Bound by Aaron Renier, or Renier, I don't know how he pronounces it. And we got Tricked by Alex Robinson. Uh, We've had these for a few weeks, we've been passing them around so that we could all read as many of them as we could. Uh... I liked what I read. I read The King, which I thought was fantastic. Yep. Uh, you you read it? Did you read it? Yep, I yeah. read it too. Yeah, yep. I, got, I got a chance to read it. I've <clears throat> oh, and you read it. Did you read it? Yep. yep. I read all of them, actually. I'm, I think I'm the only one who read all four of them. I didn't read the comic, but I read all of the trades. The circuit. And, yeah. They, all together, I think Top Shelf does a, a good job with, with uh, what they put out. Yeah. I think I only got uh I got through the first half of Tricked and then at the Baltimore show picked up Less Than Heroes and Owly and I read through all of Owly of course there's no real reading there but I read through most of Less Than Heroes and half of Tricked so yeah they do good stuff. Let's uh since you have King in your ha- in your hand let's read uh Yeah, go ahead. the uh <coughs> little release that we got with it. Uh from the award-winning creator of Three Fingers comes an all new pop culture adventure mystery. The King is an offbeat tale of one very enigmatic enigmatic Elvis impersonator who's taking the Vegas Strip and the world by storm. Shrouded in mystery with the shining gold helmet that covers his face, the King's performances are so mesmerizing that fans are starting to believe he really is Elvis Presley. Through investigative reporting and a series of thought-provoking interviews, a former tabloid journalist makes it his personal mission to find out the King's true identity. But in his race to debunk the King's latest comeback, he discovers much more than he bargained for. What's funny is I'm reading the uh, dust jacket on this, and it says uh, about Rich, he says, he got his start in comics working as an inker at Archie on the popular Sonic the Hedgehog series and has since worked on Jughead, Veronica, and Archie's Weird Mysteries. And now he's writing, you know, very mature, off the, you know, offbeat uh, comics. And, you know... I gotta tell you, I'm a guy who doesn't like Elvis. I mean, a couple of his songs are okay, but I, I really, if I never heard another Elvis song as long as I lived, I would not feel any remorse at all. And uh, and I'm not a huge independent comic guy. Uh, but this was, I, I read it in like two sittings, couldn't stop, thought it was fantastic. So, I mean, that's a, as far as I'm concerned, that's a glowing review because uh, for me to really like that, it says a lot. Of all the ones we got, this was the one, uh, well, I guess I've, um, what is it, Alex Robinson, I've heard of him. The three geek, oh, 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 Alex Robinson. Yeah, I've, I've heard of him as far as a creator goes, but uh, this guy, I've, I've bought a lot of his stuff before he's done um, 
how to pick up women if you're a comic book geek. Uh, which well, mor- everybody should read that. Then. Which, <laughs> which morphed into uh, his popular Three Geeks series, and I I definitely highly recommend anybody who wants a you know a good laugh and you know a little poking fun at yourself because I saw myself in just about all, all three of the geeks. Uh, definitely pick those up. And when I saw this, I saw this in San Diego, and as soon as I saw it, I picked it up. And I was like, ooh. And at the time, it was just you know because it's you know it's twenty bucks. But it's definitely worth twenty bucks. I mean, I was gonna pick it up somewhere down the road. I just happened to get you know get it for free to read it. But uh, it's definitely worth your time, worth your picking up. And if you like his stuff, also um, Three Fingers, which I don't know if anybody's picked up. It's kind of a unauthorized um, broad swipe at uh, Mickey Mouse and like a be- like uh, a behind yeah. the music type uh, <laughs> feel for Mickey Mouse and. Uh, and Walt Disney and all that kind of stuff, and that's that's really good too. So I, I highly recommend everything. And as soon as I saw we got that in the book, I was like, "Woohoo, yes!" And so. the the art in it is really very good. Yeah, he's he's, he's a good artist. He and really he does is. this cool kind of inking slash painting slash washing technique. I'm not sure exactly what you call it. There's a slight little color, like some blues and some some like shades of grays yeah, and, and he, stuff. And uh, it it was. It was just good start to finish. It was a cool mystery. I was scared at points where I was like, oh, man, what's going to happen? I mean, it really got me on edge, mm-hmm. which is unusual when I'm reading any any novels or anything. So I'd say mission accomplished, Rich. The thing I have to say about this is, you know, we always talk about trades and how they can help the industry. And, you know, here's this original graphic novel. Mm-hmm. Um, st- it's still divided up into different sections. They're not all equal. But... Um, you know, it's a contained story. It works as a contained story. It probably would not work as a comic, you know, like a, a monthly comic. I don't right. think you, the suspension, the, the all the the mystery, I don't think it could sustain itself over, like, how many years. I don't know exactly how how uh, divided this is. but I would say that it would, it would only have been about a yeah. – well, 12 depending on how, how big you would make it. Um, you know, it could be like a six-issue right. miniseries, but – I mean, because it's, 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 it's one of those, it's an ind- as an independent, I don't think you can put what we put, the, the the niche we throw superhero comics into, as far as those graphic novels, I think you're right. Uh, for a superhero comic, it wouldn't, but independents are just another creature altogether. And a true independent, you c- it can sustain itself because it, you don't have to have the mystery you, you just have to have a good story, and a good, good story continues. And this was a good story, so I think this would have been all right in a comic book. I well, mean, to, to oh. take it back to what Brian said, where he said he, he read it and he couldn't put it down, and he read it in two days. I mean, I was the same way. Like, you know, well, yeah, it I, was one of those that I had to fin- I had to keep going with it. And I, I think it's I think that's why he put it out in a book because right, right. it does lend itself more to a novel. Then it does. You know, this is more a novel with pictures, you know, i.e., graphic novel. But still, this is more a novel with pictures, where other ones, you know, other other comics and stuff don't, you know, aren't that. This, yeah. you know, this this was more of a novel. So I, I really think it could have sustained itself as a comic, but it's so much better as just a novel. One thing that's funny is, is you know, you, you you jump right into the whole mystery. You know, is this guy really Elvis? And and you know, uh, certainly not going to give anything away about the ending, but I quickly forgot about that, you know, almost like right away. Mm-hmm. And obviously that's the point, you know, the, the, the mystery almost becomes secondary. Yeah. And not that I, you know, was totally behind the uh, the journalist, you know, it's not like you're you're rooting for him or you, you no. associate yourself with him, but, you know, there were, there were some interesting things about... Um, why you why you seek out certain mysteries and, and and what you know every journalist I think should read this and every anybody who works for like the Inquirer and all that you know because there were some interesting things about that like you know are whatever creative force you, you work in you know do you really believe in yourself enough to 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 make that leap that this guy made the, the main guy made you mm-hmm. know you know beyond just telling a story or writing a story you know he he has a journey and and i i followed that and i was like oh, you know what that it's weird uh, it's not that i'm getting all kind of you know emotional or you know i didn't it, but it made sense it yeah. made sense I, i'm totally dancing around the issue because i don't want to say you know some things but um 
It was good. Yeah, worth going out and getting. Yeah. All right, Tasha, so which one did you like the best? My favorite was Tricked. Um, and I, I did read all four of them, and I really liked Tricked. I loved the art in it. I thought thought it was really well put together. It had a great story. And um, I'm anxious to read Alex Robinson's other book that was before this, uh, Box Office Poison, I think it is. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm anxious to pick that up. And uh, I would Jamie, have liked to... Jamie, read the description on, on this. Okay. Um, let's, let's see. It says, from the Eisner Award-winning creator of Box Office Poison, Trick follows the lives of six people. A reclusive rock legend, a heartbroken <coughs> waitress, a counterfeiter, an obsessive crank a lost daughter, and a backstabbing lover, whose lives are unconnected until an act of violence brings them spiraling on each other, onto each other. Combining intriguing characters and a story structure that is both complex and innovative, Tricked is not to be missed. And there are a couple. Robinson is the master of true-to-life relationship drama from uh, Library Journal. And it says Robinson is nothing short of remarkable shotgun reviews. So that's that's one of the ones I didn't get a chance to read. I really wanted to, but I just, with everything else, I just, uh, you know, I've I've heard about him. Like I said, he's one of the other ones. Box Office Poison, I hear, is amazing. And uh, I think it's definitely mm-hmm. worth um, checking out. It was the I think the longest one out of the four that we got. But yeah, uh, it's, it's a hefty book. Yeah, I mean, it's got some. It's twenty bucks. Some weight to it's, it. <laughs> it's worth every penny based mm-hmm. on the size and weight and you know girth of the well, thing and, alone. Well, and the story too. I mean, it it, it was very well put together, it tied up nicely. It was it was very. Uh, a, a question for you, Tasha. I know you. We've finally gotten you to start reading. I should. I we've gotten you. You yeah. finally started reading. <laughs> um, Strangers in Paradise. I know you picked that up. How yeah. does this compare? Because I, I love Strangers in Paradise. I think he that is one of the best interactive, you know, relationship type books. How does this compare to to that? Well, I think this covers. Now, I only read the first mm-hmm. trade of Strangers in Paradise so far, so I don't know how far along the story gets. How many mm-hmm. more characters they bring in? This covers more characters and more. Um, more relationship issues, I guess you could say, okay. m- maybe. Um, I think Strangers in Paradise is more um, geared for girl for girls, maybe. Okay. Um, this I think pretty much anybody could be into this. It doesn't like focus on a girl's point of view of a, a relationship okay. kind of thing. I just I, I mean, what I was trying to get at was: is it just is is does it have the same feel? I mean, is it? Yeah, I think is it the it, same rela- you know relationship. I think it's along the, s- the same sort of lines. Okay. Um, I'm just trying to get some you know some like focal points for people to say, okay, well I've read Strangers in Paradise, and if she likes that, and this is along the same lines, maybe that's you know something you want to try. What without giving away any kind of like plot point, uh, can you explain why it's called Tricked? Is that possible? No, I can't even remember anything. <laughs> um, here, you, go ahead. I, I can tell you that she got my disease. <laughs> <laughs> I can True. tell you that um, I read the first half of it, and I agree with everything Tasha said. It's very interesting. The characters work very well together. Tricked the the rock stars band was named yeah, Trick, that's what it was. and I don't know personally how Tricked becomes involved, but that's right. where I think you get the trick okay. from. It's just that it was his rock band. Let me tell you. Before we even go into the other ones, the one thing that's consistent in all of these publications is the amazing quality of their of the physical book. The they have the, right. They have nice covers. It feels good to hold in your hand. The the graphics are excellent. Uh, like Spiral Bound, which we didn't talk about yet, is shaped and looks like a Spiral Bound notebook yep. you know it, it's not spiral bound but it has a picture of a spiral bound and the edges are curved and it has little blue lines on the side well they're actually gray but it um you know lines on the side that look like a spiral bound notebook mm-hmm. I, I mean it's and open up the front cover and you'll see the uh you know it has the inside cover this belongs to you know yeah it, it is exact i mean it is they're so well done their their um you know graphic designer or whomever does all the stuff is worth every penny they get uh, because this is uh, you know 
by far the nicest looking publications and beat marvel dc all that stuff they just have a quality to them that's unsurpassed and from what i've seen at them at, at shows they're when when you look at at their product and it's set up so nicely it's just a beautiful presentation it makes you want to buy them. yeah it does it makes you want to stop it makes you want to pick them up it makes you want to look at them and it, it ultimately ultimately makes you want to buy them because the people behind the counter again are you know they're going to sell you this book they're going to they're going to tell you you know what it's about they're going to want you to walk away with a book and that's you know that's the name of the game i can totally attest to that when i was in baltimore looking around at their stuff i spent almost 40 bucks there mm-hmm. buying a couple stuff and, and it looks great the way they present everything is beautiful not to mention that if you're at a con where top shelf has a booth if you want to find the comic ba- the hot comic babes that are at the convention they'll oh, be at the yeah. top shelf booth so you know Set aside twenty bucks and and you know scope it out. And when there's a hot chick there, you know that's when you buy the book and pretend. You know, well not pretend because you'll really like it, but you know, play that up, man. Or, or that's stand, how you'll score. Right stand there. there and be stupid and just you know, is this good? And then let her start talking to you, man. <laughs> that's right. Um, we should also say Adam Walenta is the colorist on King. So okay. Rich Kozlowski is is the writer artist and Adam Walenta. The, yeah, and you're right. The packaging, the you know the designing of it, even even this one, it's it's. You know, bigger than a digest, right? Mm-hmm. right but like, smaller but, than a comic. Right, and it's still pretty thick, and it has these uh, <coughs> pseudo dust jacket flaps on each one that right. make it look kind of like, you know, a real, like a like a, an all, important all, book. You know? And all the covers are built for, like, wear and tear. You don't have to worry yeah. about bending them or really, you know, they're, they're built to be read. They're built to yeah, be... Yeah, if, you if you're a book lover, not necessarily a comic book lover, but a book lover, you know, if you just get... A small pleasure from holding a new book in your hand and and the texture and the smell and all that stuff or whatever you will like these books mm-hmm. like i i read books and we have a library in our house but I, and when i you know I, I when i get a nice feeling book i was like ooh, this is this is nice mm-hmm. i opened up the package with all these things and i'm like wow look oh look at this one wow and that's honest to god how i felt yeah and i know it sounds like we're you know we're kissing ass because we got some free books but no, I've, I've always, I've, 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 always I was say, I've, I've known about this yep. this company, and I was very happy when you know we contacted them. And they were interested in us, and uh, you know when they sent they sent uh, the stuff, it was like you know, well, you guys know. I mean, you out there know that we don't stand behind. We don't we don't randomly praise stuff. I do not randomly praise stuff unless it's good, and this is just good stuff. It just really and truly is good stuff worth your money if you like the independence. I was just going to say that um, before, well, t- before Strangers in Paradise, which was the first independent thing that I really read, um, I was reading mostly superhero stuff that Brian got me into. Um, and now that I started reading this, you know, top shelf stuff, it, I'm really getting into independent stuff mm-hmm. and I'm, I'm loving it. And, I, you know, everything that they've, they've sent us, I just think is great. And um, I'm anxious to read some more. I got a big smile over here because it just, yeah, and I, I know how somebody talked about all this independent stuff with. I've talked to these guys about the the superheroes, but I read so again. much He's independent like, stuff. Oh, you don't read enough independent. They don't. I'm sorry, no. you guys don't. The the um, the the funny thing is, is like you can't really even put a put. You can't second guess the pricing on some of these things because, like, like you said, the king is twenty. Tricked is you know this huge. is twenty too. Yeah, tricked right? is twenty. And then, but then you got Spiral Bound, which is actually bigger than Tricked uh, well, in its size, size, but not in the page count. But that's only fourteen ninety five. You know, and it's like, yeah. so you're really getting quality stuff. I mean, this is uh, the when um, when we just said about you know we've known about Jamie said he knew about Top Shelf before they put out a uh, comic book artist uh, volume two now, mm-hmm. and uh, the quality on that book is it's a set it's a ma- it's magazine size but it's square bound. Um, and it's I think usually around like seven ninety five, nine ninety five. You know, it jumps depends on how thick it is. And that's another book that just has great quality to it. So uh, de- you, you're you're not gonna you can't go wrong if there's something that you know catches your eye with one of these things. And with comic book artists, they're up to like issue six or seven now. I think so. It's well, not six is six is, is coming out. Very coming delayed out. <laughs> from what we heard from Baltimore. Yeah, so it's, it's not. The, 
it's not something un- unattainable if pump people want to go back and pick right. up everything. It, this number six is the Will Eisner tribute, and it has yet to come out. Um, and the guy at, in Baltimore even said, you know, we're, it, it'll be there. I think he said it's definitely shipping in another month or so. I, I think, think that's, that's what, what he said. He said. Yeah. So, uh, but it will be out. Was talk his about name Chris Staros? I'm not sure if that's who. Is that who we talked to? I, th- I believe so. Okay. Isn't he the? Is he, he? He's the guy in charge, right? I assume. Yeah. That's my impression. I, I don't know. You, you guys talked to him while I was walking <laughs> around other places. So, because it's not a very. I don't. My impression is it's not a huge outfit. You right. Know, it's a couple no. of people running the show, and different creators writing books. Mm-hmm. And so, do you remember how Mike Horn expre- explained how Palisades was an L- LLC? Was it? Right. Um, that's what this is. It's an LLC where they take people that want to produce books and they they promote them. They put them together and promote them, right? Not like their own company where they have hired writers and stuff, but right. they're just a promotions was, at this point. Is Top Shelf the company that, like, a year or two back, that they almost were going to go? There was a company that was was like flailing, and and they you know they just kind of put it out there and said you know we need to get back in the black and and this whole outpouring of you know they bought stuff out the wazoo and it you know just. It just got them back into you know better financial need, and I, I can't remember if that was top shelf or not. So I have to do research on that. But it was this incredible thing that this whatever company it was when they, when they put it out there, you know, everybody started ordering and ordering and ordering, and it saved them. It really saved them. And I think it's I think it's top shelf. So I'll have to do a little research on that. So what about uh, Spiral Bound? Let me read the uh, description here. With an ensemble cast straight from a box of animal crackers, this delightful tale of ambition, morality, and self-discovery is the first major work by extraordinary newcomer Aaron Renier. Drawn in a decidedly beautiful fashion, reminiscent of Richard Scarry and Louis Trondheim, Renier has given us a fully realized and compellingly adventurous narrative, at once both achingly naive and profoundly worldly. This tightly crafted graphic novel is the real deal and will charm your socks off. A remarkable debut. And the dogs are barking. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I was going to say that I think that this is a great book uh, for for kids who read like Harry Potter and that kind of thing. I think that that it's a great, great... um, to get them into comics because it's it's got a great story to it and um yeah it says right on the back the lemony snicket has a a review on the back you know a little a series of unfortunate events from a series of unfortunate events so it's great for that right along those lines of you know that kind of story and Hmm. it's good for kids does anybody remember the uh the children's books or whatever they were that it was like a whole bunch of animals on the school bus the pickles or something like that. Is that what that is? Yeah, I remember that pickles. Yeah, it was kind. Ca- Came with a record and stuff. Yeah, it ca- this this kind of reminded me of that because they're all you know it's all animals. It's it, our animals are the main character. You know, elephants and rabbits and birds and uh, uh, dogs and whales. Even um, there's a school teacher whale in this big uh, train. She, she's like in a bubble and it has uh, tank wheels that she can you know travel around and. Um, so and it and it is very it it is de- all ages. I mean, you could you know. Oh yeah, definitely. Either you read it to your younger child or have them read it. Uh, it's simple enough that they could, if they're at a certain level, they can you know read it as well. The panels are easy to follow. There 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 were a few times that that I felt um, you'd be on one page and there'd be something happening, and then the last two panels jump to the next scene. I, I found that a little jarring at times. Uh, did you did you experience yeah some that? of some of the like they would mention something and I'd be like why uh, they would lose me for a couple of seconds yeah. but I found that happening in one of the other books too I think it was the Jeffrey ba- Brown one he was doing that too it was kind of confusing me a little bit but yeah and part of that could just be you know that they're not married they don't they don't have to be to, uh, they don't have to be as particular as comics you know because mm-hmm. comics are only twenty two pages so you got to get that story out in twenty two pages. These, this is about, this is what, over 170. So, you know, he can develop it as, as he wishes. So it's not a critique. It's just something that I had to get used to. You know, I was like, oh, oh, he just did it again. But then he would go into these really awesome parts like when, uh, well, I don't want to say, but, you know, where you get a full splash page. Um, 
bigger bigger panels that that made it made sense and it also kind of gave impact to the story which i appreciate it because there's a lot of smaller panels in this too so, yeah um and the story is just it's did we read the you read the synopsis for this mm-hmm. right yeah yes it's, it's where were you when i did that? I, I don't know were you sleeping um it's 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 just a simple story i mean it's it's part friendship part little mystery part uh uh town the town getting together you know it's it's also generational older versus, versus younger um i think it, it's great the amount of characters he created there's yeah. so many different characters um for such a you know story it really was nice it made you feel like you got a whole concept of the whole town right. and i could see a, a whole series of these coming out um with various adventure adventures that they're going on yeah i mean because that when you first read it you know you're you're getting you know just one character after another or you get to the one scene where they just they go into like the local hangout spot and there's all these little characters in the background and most of those characters pop up later in the story yeah so he's he's definitely got an idea going throughout the whole thing and uh you know, if you're a fan of, like I said, the Pickles or Emmett Otter's Jug Band Christmas or, you know, any of those where they just incorporate tons and tons of animals in one story, well, like, you're going to you know, love like it. This one thing said Richard Scarry. I mean, as a kid, I had all those books, and mm-hmm. I had the Puzzle Town things, and, uh, man, I played with that endlessly. And, it, and I read, I, I read like, the first 10 or 20 pages of this before I had to pass it off on to someone else. And, uh, you know, it, it now that I read that, it does kind of remind me of that. Yeah. Here's some uh, on the back. They have uh, uh, Chris Duffy. He's a senior editor of Nickelodeon magazine. He says, this first graphic novel reminds me of the Mad Scientist Club and Harriet the Spy. It's a world where hopes pan out, goodness is rewarded, and where there are many opportunities for art, adventure, comedy, and uncovering dark secrets. So, I mean, it, I, it's, it was very enjoyable. I was surprised. I mean, when I saw it, I was like, whoa, this is long. And then you get reading, and you're like, you know, you're halfway through the book by the time you're done. Yeah, it went really fast. Yeah. I think that also right right there talks to the diversity that this company of what it puts out. I mean, to put out a book like that, Owly, you were talking about, which is a, another kid's book, to Tricked, to Box Office Poison. I guess they also, I think they put out Blankets. I don't want to say for sure that that's one of the books that the well, he's, Top Shelf Craig puts Thompson out. Craig Thompson is back here quoted, so maybe. Okay. maybe. And it, we haven't even talked about AAIOU, which is basically about, you know, an adult relationship and just the diversity this company puts out it's it's well worth seeking out i wanted to say um on alley i i went there looking for something to bring back you know every dad goes to a, a function or a place and wants to bring back a gift and i wanted to bring back something that i can incorporate to both boys and um talking to tasha she had um, a free comic book day issue of alley and then who who was the gentleman that walked up to us brandon from out out in the west coast he was in for the Diamond Show. Oh, yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. Brand, and he, X. Brand X. And he started talking about it, and he said that his four-year-old loved Owly. Well, that just sold me right away because my oldest is four. So I went and picked up both. There's not really any words in the books, and it's 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 drawn by Andy Runton, um, who was at the show and I met. Very nice guy. Um, and And Brandon had suggested that he sits with his – daughter and has her describe to him what's going on as he's looking through and i'm looking through this and it's very cute it looks like a cuddly little creature um and i'm looking forward to sitting down with my boys and reading it It, it's really i page through them both and they're great it's a classic example of sequential art yeah because there are no words he has to tell the story using the pictures and he was the nicest guy and and uh he 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 autographed both my copies to both my boys and drew a little sketch of Ali in them which it it's just cute as can be uh it, it's great i'd recommend it for anybody they were 10 dollars each i think and it's well worth it they're thick little digest size maybe a little bit smaller books um and they were great uh the other thing i picked up was less than heroes and it it caught my eye just because it said heroes and and of course like most of the other guys i'm more of a classic hero comic book reader um, but of course, now with readings tricked, and I want to read some of these other things, I will delve into more independent. But less than heroes, um, it centers around a world where you want me to read. Yeah, the, uh, yeah, go ahead. That's great. In the city of Philadelphia, there is a tall building at 18th and Market Street, atop of which lives four individuals. They are the official protectors of the city. Their job is to be around when traditional law enforcement fails. 
But are they really heroes? Meet Philadelphia's contracted superhero team, Threshold, a quartet more interested in milk and cookies than crime and punishment, a team more concerned with battling indigestion than their arch enemies. Sure, they have superpowers. They can leap tall buildings, fly, and do all the stuff other heroes do. More than human? Probably. Less than heroes? Without a doubt. It, it, and that describes it exactly. Um, it's a little quirky, which I related a little bit to the, to the Giffen de Mateus run of Justice League because it's a little quirky and kiddingly. Um, it's a little odd. The art is not quite as clean as some other things that I do like, but I think it will fit this book as I delve more towards the end of it. It's, it seems to work very well. Some of the dialogue gets a little bland at spots, um, but it's only for like two, three panels put together where you really wouldn't need it to be. But otherwise, I'm, I'm really enjoying it. Uh, I'm, I'm going to pass it off to, to you guys when I'm done with it. It's, it's very enjoyable. I'm, I'm looking forward to finishing it. Cool. And then the last one we got is A-E-I-O-U and Easy Intimacy by Jeffrey Brown. And this is the smallest of the books, but it's not – it's uh, – I don't have any page numbers. It was the fastest to read, but, it, you know, it's a nice little size uh, little independent story here. It's a definitely, you know, slice of life kind of story. Um, and who it's read – It's 224 pages. Who read this? I did. I did. And I did, too. Okay. So and I read. think uh, – yeah. Seeing <laughs> – yeah, hearing from you guys and, and my opinion – I think it's definitely a guy's book. Is that how you felt? Well, yeah, it's, it's told well, from it's the guy's point of view. From the guy, and he yeah. says yeah, it's I a know, true but story. Like, I mean, the story, personally, I think was fine. I have a really hard time when I can't get into the art. And his art, really, I couldn't get into because it's more, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a very crude yeah, artwork. It's, very it's, it's one of those... It has its niche. It's it's very typically independent. It's uh, that's what I call it. I call it a very typically independent. It's not the most polished art artwork that there is. But he's telling a story, so the yeah. story kind of takes I more precedence over the well, artwork. And, and despite the 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 crudeness of the art, I still found it to be expressive. Yeah, you know the yeah. people's yeah. faces. You, you knew who you were talking about. You knew it wasn't, what they were doing mm-hmm. in each scene. You know, I, I could see emotion in that artwork. I'll read what he has in the back. He says, although based on actual events, this book leaves uh, so much left unsaid that you may as well consider it to be fiction. Time and memory have a way of distorting things, and Sophia's side, the female character, of the story is necessarily lacking. Perhaps someday I will be reconciled with her, but until this, I mean, but until then, this book is dedicated to Sophia with apologies, regrets, thanks, anger, sadness, love, and a million other mixed emotions. Mm -hmm. Um... I felt the same way. Like it, the story does take take over, and it read like a memory. Like it was so little, you know. And there yes. even there's two panels per pages, sometimes one. Mm-hmm. It read like a memory, and like I just flipped to the one scene where she, there's one panel where she's kind of dancing for him, and she looks all kind of weird. And and those moments are very true. Like when I think about any relationship that kind of went south, you know, th- this is the kind of stuff you do remember. You don't remember long drawn out conversations you you remember chunks snippets, snippets yeah. and and, mm-hmm. and you remember you focus on the bad parts you focus on what made the relationship fall apart you know mm-hmm. and there's a lot of that in this and i think that's why i i was like wow i really i really like that i guess it's kind of hard for me to relate to that maybe that's what the problem is because i haven't had any other relationships that <laughs> went bad <laughs> so um, <laughs> i don't know but now that you say that how it read like a memory that makes sense and yeah. maybe um have to look at the art again and maybe that would make a lot more sense to me now and i was just wondering where he was in my life with that tape recorder because i swear there were conversations in that book that i was like damn i've had that conversation (laughs) and yes definitely yeah yeah yeah. and there's some things in it too like where where there's no words and it's just you know images and you know you like you said it's very expressive and, and you know that's the stuff that happens you know you remember one scene and you forget what what you said but you remember how that person came in. When was the first time you saw them? When was your first fight? When was your first makeup? You know, when did it? When did you know that it was actually going to go wrong? And oh, it really was a good one. We're book. we're getting a guest caller. Our here. first call in. Let me let me answer. The, let's hopefully it's it's the person we're expecting. Sure. Hello, Jeff. Uh oh. Jeff. Hold no. on there. Oh, oh boy. 
technical difficulties. Wait a minute. Please. Jeff? Oh, Please there he is. By. Hello? Hello? Yes, I'm right here. Oh, um, there he is. I'm sorry. We... <laughs> We, I didn't have the volume turned up. <laughs> I was all worried something was going on, and I just didn't have the... So this is on the phone is Jeff Clock, Who we interviewed way back in episode That's right, if 45. You remember, he's the author of How to Read Superhero Comics and Why. Uh, welcome back to the show, Jeff. Well, thanks for having me back. I appreciate uh, uh, Peter inviting me back. What time is it over there? It's uh, 1230 at night. <laughs> oh, boy. You work so, hard? Hey, I'll stay up late. Talk about Graham Morrison. Get, get me at any hour. I'm ready to go. <laughs> So the, we haven't even explained to the audience why you're calling in because we were still in another discussion. Peter, well, it's your bit. Sure. Um, for the past few episodes, we've been uh, doing a little, you know, look backs at some of DC's events. Well, all of DC's events leading up to Infinite Crisis. And it just so happens that we're up to uh, DC 1 million, which was in 1998. And it was by Grant Morrison and Val. And we always get this last name wrong. Semix. Or Semix. S- Semix. Semix. Is that what he's? Okay. And since it was written by Grant Morrison, I decided to do, say, hey, why not bring back Jeff Clock? He's a big Morrison fan. And you said you were going to read it. Did you read it? I did. I reread them. I've, I've reread uh, the issues just in the, in the last uh, hour and a half or so. And I've jotted down some notes and some things that I thought were worth talking about in this context. Great. So why don't I just quick give a, a brief rundown, unless you want to do that, or you want to go to more important stuff with it or... You want me to just do the rundown? Real hey, quick? you invited me. You guys invited me, so you can start any way you want, and okay. you know, you tell me when to go, and I'll you know fire out. You know, cool. I'm ready to go. <laughs> so uh, DC One Million was four issues. It was a 1998 event, and the whole idea was that uh, there's a Justice League uh, counterpart millions of years into the future. It's actually a million months uh, in the future from the time of um, Action Comics number one when Superman was. Uh, Superman or Action One came out with Superman, um, and uh, you know there's a Superman counterpart, Wonder Woman counterpart, Batman, Starman, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They come back to the to our time uh, to invite the Justice League, our Justice League, to the future to participate in these like very Olympian type games, to in a celebration of um, what they call the Prime Superman coming back. Uh, uh, basically coming out of the sun, the prime Superman being the Superman that we know, Kal-El, who's still alive millions of years in the future, and um, or not millions of years, but um, he's been in the sun recharging, and they're all waiting for this for him to come out. Of course, something goes wrong, and there's this, you know, Vandal Savage is involved, and there's this, this sun, this tyrant sun called Solaris, and uh, things go wrong as they travel into the future, and there's this whole big event that spawns out of it, and... Um, what happened with the other crossovers into other books is every book that month went into uh, into the million numbering. So you had Robin one million and Young Justice one million and and Hit, uh, Hitman one million, Lobo and all these crazy There's crossover a Star things. Starman too, right? Starman one million. Yep. Chase, Chase, JLA, so on and so forth. And um, some of them were good. Some of them, you know, had Not no so much. had no connection to the story whatsoever. The main chunk of the story is in those four issues. So let's. I'll hand it over to Jeff, and so he can give his thoughts. Uh, sure. Well, um, okay. Well, let's start off. We'll start off with Grant Morrison. He he took Morrison, of course, took over the book in in 1996, um, and he took over, and it was just sort of gasps of horror. This is this would be the, you know it's almost the equivalent of handing over Indiana Jones to sort of saying that oh well the fourth install installation the Indiana Jones series will be directed by David Lynch. Uh, right, because this is Grant Morrison was known for doing Arkham Asylum and Animal Man, where he appeared as himself in this insane Doom Patrol, where he just made all the characters into sort of freaks. Uh, but JLA turned out to be a kind of refreshing kind of. You know, it showed that Morrison had a real sense for sort of classic comics and and you know just having fun with the the sort of core characters. And he put the lineup as Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Flash, Green Lantern, Aquaman, and Martian Manhunter. And you've got uh, he brings in some extra characters in like Green Arrow and Zoriel and Huntress and Steel and Plastic Man and Oracle. Um, and in the JLA, as he's got it, they've already fought off uh, White Martians and Evil Angels and the Key, um, the Injustice Gang, including Lex Luthor and the Joker, Prometheus, who's a kind of reverse Batman, and they teamed up with Sandman, of all people, to fight Starro the Conqueror, and then DC One Million. The, the, idea, the, interesting, the, the idea about the One Million, this is in the, in the 90s, is that there was, this, there was this really really silly kind of trend that it caught on with, with number, giving issues ridiculous numbers. Right, I think I believe it was Zero Hour where they were all numbered number zero. Is that correct? Yeah, that's it. So you had a whole bunch of comics were coming out with their you know issue number zero, 
And then you had, I remember the Marvel, maybe, maybe it was the X-Men titles, maybe it was bigger than that. They all had negative one issues. These, these comic books that took place before our heroes became heroes, you know, so a, they yeah, had sort of a X-Men one, negative yep. one is Scott yeah. Summers in the, uh, you know, in the orphanage or something. Yep. Uh, Wizard was releasing issue number one half of things, which I think they still do. And Morrison sat down and said, well, what's another ridiculous number I can come up with? We've had zeros and negative ones and one half. What's an absolutely silly number we can do? And they, Perry had begun already, and somebody had released an issue pie of something. I don't remember who it was. <laughs> was some... So Morrison came up with an absolutely ridiculous number, DC 1 million, and he calculated out that, you know, a million months in the future would be the 853rd century, and he went ahead and did this uh, this story, um, which is which is his... Interpret. I mean, and, you know, of course, these big crossover events have been, you know, major uh, comics events for a long time, and this is more some sort of interpretation of of what's a, it's a superhero subgenre, right? The company wide crossover is a is a superhero subgenre, and this is Morrison's attempt to kind of breathe new life into it. Um, and I, I thought to sort of anchor talking about it, I, I would quote Grant Morrison himself in an interview. Uh, this is an interview that he did in a book called uh, I think it was Writers on Comic Script Writing, uh, which came out in uh, 1999, I believe. Um, and I just want to read this quote because I, I think it's really interesting in this conversation. Um, Morrison says this, The way I look at it, comic book superhero stories are pretty simple. There's one guy who's got one set of powers, and he's got to fight another guy who's got another set of powers, or else he's got to deal with a natural disaster or something. But instead of seeing that as a limitation, I looked at it as if you're a blues musician, and you've got just three chords, C, G, and D. That's it. But if you add two minor chords, you've got every Beatles song. So you go in there and you start to really improvise, add in those minor chords. If, say, Superman has got to come in and this baddie beats him up a bit, and then Superman rallies and comes back, then what I have to do is disguise that enough so readers don't realize they've been reading the same story all their life. That's where the creativity comes in. This is, I, I think that, that's, that's interesting in terms of him coming at the... Yeah, that's his perspective on, on comics. And this is, that's at the same time. I mean, that was published, you know, right around the time when he's sort of wrapping up his JLA run. So that's not just his interpretation of comics, but particularly of, of his Justice League of America experience. Um, so he starts off with this idea of, of redoing the, uh, you know, the kind of com- company-wide summer crossover. And, of course, these issues, just like, um, ju- it's just like House of M in terms of structure, right? We have the sort of, it's a mini-series that comes out once a week, here four issues instead of eight, uh, and then there are reverberations into the larger titles. So, you, you know, they, had, they would have their one million issues. Instead of having sort of Spider-Man, House of Marvel 1 through 3, or House of M 1 through 3, you've got, uh, you know, they, they just have one single issue, uh, you, know, you know, whatever, uh, Batman 1 million, uh, and then the mini-series. Um, so, so he talks about these ideas he's got where, where he's got to add in minor chords. He's got to do these kinds of tricky, funny, clever things to kind of, to kind of dazzle us to, so that we don't realize this is essentially, I mean, that there's something kind of basic about a story where the heroes show up and something goes wrong and they rally back. Um, so he puts in these, he, and, and DC 1 million is a chance for him to really let these, these lunatic ideas that he's famous for fly. And they're all, the story is packed full of these absolutely ludicrous and brilliant things in there. Uh, for example, Our Man, uh, in the very first issue of the, of the miniseries, introduces himself as a Tyler Chemo Robotics Diamond Generation Intelligent Machine Colony. Um, uh, later on, there's uh, genetically altered atomic bullets that Steel has. Um, the future Batman uh, def- uh, uh, beats up on, on uh, our, t- our Batman uh, by using a martial arts move derived from a telepathic octopus species a telepathic, the martial arts move derived from a telepathic opt- octopus species from the infotions of Durla. Um, and it just fills with these completely crazy... My, my head you know, hurts sort of, already. <laughs> what? My head hurts already. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, they got, you know, Wonder Woman at one point launches out a data-encoded virtual torpedo. Um, I mean, these are, it's just filled with just absolute lunacy, and that's what makes the story dazzling. The little details and all the really crazy stuff that he comes up with. The idea, for instance, that, um, you know... Solaris puts a virus into our man so that when he goes to the 20th century, he unwittingly releases this terrible techno virus that makes machines and people go completely crazy. Um, and of course, later on in the story, it turns out that the virus is it's not just a virus. It only looks like a virus. It's actually Solaris' mind. And the only way to save the 20th century from madness and destruction is to create Solaris, to siphon off the virus, which will program Solaris. So this was, they have to create the villain that sent us back in time in the first place in order to save the 20th century so he can, so Solaris can then destroy the 853rd century. I mean, it's, it's filled with these just insanely clever ideas, and that's really where the, where the, the interest of it lies. Um, the real thing that I, that I think Morrison's doing here, um, I don't know, I should slow down and, and, and you know, 
maybe you guys want to interject here. No, no, no. Keep going. No, no. finish. Wrap up your thoughts. All right. Well, well, I think the I think the thing that makes this, I think the thing that makes DC One Million different. I think the thing that the twist on the history of the crossover, right? Is this is a crossover that came. I mean, you're comparing it to. You guys are talking in the context of sort of Crisis on Infinite Earths and and uh, you know House of M and an Infinite Crisis. And, and nowhere in DC One Million did anybody say the Justice League will never be the same. Tune in here, universes collide, and nothing you know is true. Like, there, there's no sense that something radically and drastic is about to change about the DC universe. And nothing does, right? It's a, it's a great story, but it doesn't claim to be a kind of editorial event where the, the sort of bigwigs at DC Comics are going to change the whole universe. And if you don't read this, you'll be left out. And it, because because the, the aim of the... The aim of, say, Crisis on Infinite Earths was to clean up the universe, and if you missed out on that, you're going to show up and you're going to be confused. Whereas DC One Million claimed to be nothing more than a really good story, a well-told, fun, superhero yarn that everybody could get behind and have fun, right? So there's, there's, um, he's not trying to kill off continuity, right? He's not, in the this is not Crisis on Infinite Earths where he's going to sort of, you know, get rid of junk from the past. He's not trying, in fact, in fact, you know, one of the famous things they got rid of in, in Christ and Earth was the sort of super pets, right? Sort of Beppo the super monkey <laughs> was a kind of embarrassing piece of 50s continuity, I think, from 50s. Um, and of course, in DC 1 million, there's a, there's a, uh, I think it's a, something like the super-powered zoomorphs are attacking Solaris, and you see uh, sort of a super-powered horse uh, in, the, in one, of the, one of the scenes. Um, all, you know, they're all attacking Solaris and getting wiped out. Um, yeah, the super zoomorphs led by Prodi One Million and Mastermind. Um, so yeah, the, but the thing, so so the, so he's he's not claiming to change the universe here. He's just he's going at it straight. It's a straight story, um, and and this this ties into what DC Million DC One Million has this emphasis on heritage, right? The most crossovers tell you since everything's going to change, there's this sense of breaking with the past, right? The Marvel Universe, you know, if everything changes after House of M, meaning we're trying to leave behind stuff. We're going to start fresh or start new or do something. You're essentially cutting yourself off from the past. Christ on Infinite Earth is just to cut itself off from previous stories and start new. This is, you've got to be here for this because nothing you learned before is going to be useful for the future. Um, and Morrison goes against that. Morrison's story is about heritage and about continuity and about things being valuable from all different historical periods. There's a tremendous scene early on when, when uh, Superman from the 20th century meets his, uh, his ancestor, who has come back in time to meet him. And they're both, Superman looks at him and he says, you know, this is, you know, this is amazing for me to meet you. You're, you know, I can't believe that you know, I inspired something that's sort of still around uh, you know, this far into the future. Um, he's, you know, he's, you know, the future Superman says, faster than a speeding tachyon, more powerful than the gravitational pull of a collapsing star, able to leap from world to world in a single bound. That's what they say about me. Um, and he's, he's amazed. He says he, it's astonishing that, that this guy still exists, uh, or that he's got, a de- he's got you know, descendants. And of course, the, the future Superman is, is impressed because he's meeting the original. So they're both stunned by each other, right? He's stunned at the original Superman from the future is stunned by the original Superman, the original Superman is stunned at the descendants. And there's, there's a sense of goodwill between vastly different centuries, right? Um, and that, that, we, that there's a kind of heritage in it, that, that, that this is all valuable and we should keep it all. And Starman uh, is, I think, the most interesting thing to talk about uh, in this context. Um, the Starman, Starman is, is from the 853rd century Starman, comes back in time, and it turns out he's a traitor. He's been working, Solaris has turned him, uh, and what he's going to do is he's, gonna, he's involved in placing the, the kryptonite, they, they call it the night fragment, um, the kryptonite um, on Mars so that he can kill, so that Solaris can use that kryptonite fragment in the 853rd century to kill Superman as he emerges from the sun, a kind of bullet he's going to fire off from Mars at the sun that's going to kill Superman. And, and Starman, the 853rd century Starman, is, his, is, his, uh, is the traitor who's going who's to make this happen for Solaris. Uh, and, of course, Starman uh, suddenly changes his mind. He says, I don't want to be a traitor, because he's met the original Starman, and he realizes that this is valuable, and he doesn't want to kill everybody and turn on these people. But one of the things that's surprising is the 853rd century is a kind of utopia. It's a, it's a it's sort of info world where information is shared, and it's this wonderful utopia. The supercomputers guide all information, and we have all of this stuff. And, again, that information is, all, is the same thing. It's about heritage and history, and it's all there for you all the time. And it's utopia. So, of course, the question arises, if this is utopia, why on earth with Starman, uh, why would he turn on, you know, why would he turn, why would he change? And this is the, and so Starman, uh, when he goes up to, he charges up, when he goes to turn on Solaris, 
uh, in the 20th century so that the whole universe isn't killed by Solaris powering up as they create him. And he says this, In the end, what made me turn back to good was remembering the light in old man Knight's eyes, the costume, the heritage, like it was all still new and meaningful. In the system, in the 853rd century, nothing meant anything because everything was possible. So I sold my soul to Solaris because I couldn't think of anything better to do. That's the honest truth. I couldn't buy it back. I knew that, but I could look good trying. It's a bizarre motivation for villainy. What he's essentially saying is that in the future, where everything was possible, everybody was good, and he felt like he, had, he wanted to do something different. He needed to react against something or, or be part of it. You know, he needed to make his own thing. He couldn't just sort of be in this utopia. Utopia is boring. Right? Everybody knows that you know, Dante's uh, paradise is the most boring part of the Divine Comedy because you know, you can, everybody has fun reading about hell and the terrible things that happen there, but you know, nobody wants to read about all the saints living in heaven. It's dull. So, so he, he's, he's bored in this kind of utopia, and he sort of reacts against that. And what's interesting in this is what Morrison's got him saying is essentially that it's, it's heritage by reconnecting with, with the original characters, the, you know, the original Starman, and the, and, and the history and the heritage. That's what makes him turn back to good again. Um, and it's funny because it, it, it shows that, that Morrison's interested in continuity and history and heritage uh, to the point where, to the point where you know, he, it's, it's valuable to have it. He says... It, it, he went bad because everything was possible, so nothing meant anything. And isn't that what we're talking about? We're talking about universes starting over. When we talk about um, rebooting or something, if everything is possible, we can remake these characters any way we want. Um, but, there's, but if we ignore history, if we ignore the heritage, um, then it, it, it becomes it's no longer meaningful. Uh, and, and Morrison's kind of saving that. I and you kind and, and, and that, that's what makes that's the twist on DC One Million that makes it different from the other from other big crossovers. It doesn't. It, it's a good story. And it's not here to change the universe, but it's here to, to show you something about continuity rather than discontinuity. I never actually looked at it like that. And what's funny, at the wrap-up of the story is you get Superman coming out of the sun. He's gold, which is that a throwback to the first Superman in action number one, Golden Age Superman. Absolutely. And, and he gives the little wink at the end to, uh, well, it's actually to Kyle Rayner, but it really is to us readers as well. So again, He looks right at us. Yeah. So cool. Yeah, and it's, I mean, it's, you know, that's, and what has he done? He's restored, I mean, you know, he's kind of restored a sort of golden age Superman, and it's all there, right? It's all available, and all the history is all there, rather than, you know, saying that we're going to cut off, cut ourselves off from the old stuff. It's all, it's all there, and it's all, you know, it's all available. And I think that, that's, that's really, to me, I think that's what's, what's really interesting about DC One Million. It's like, it's a revival of that genre, and I think we're, I, I you know, I think for that, I think it, it's a, it's a really stunning, it's a stunning piece of work. Jeff, we have on our forum, uh, <laughs> Somebody started a thread. It, what's, Brian's going to read it here. It, so just, uh, I think it was today or yesterday, someone started a thread called Your Favorite Moment on CGS. And while you were talking, I was looking and I saw that someone had just posted a new one, just like literally while you were talking. So I scrolled down to look what it was, and this guy just posted. He says his favorite moment is the episode we did on Crisis on Infinite Earths, and also that coked up Grant Morrison fan from Oxford. <laughs> awesome! I swear to God, that's ex- that happened while you were on the phone. He just that cur- guy can absolutely. Let me tell you something. That guy, whoever he is, can blurb my next book. He can put that right on the back of the book. Oh, that's awesome. up Grant Morrison fan. Right yeah. on the, when I write my definitive study of all things Grant Morrison, he's absolutely got it. He he, and it, it's funny. He puts his location is London, England, but he says I'm American. Damn it. So. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, movement, movement to England will have that effect on you. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jeff, uh, thank you for your input. That was, uh, I think, the, you know, you did a much better job than Peter did on all yeah, his past. I have uh, to admit, <laughs> uh, little uh, versions of the wrap up from Crisis. So he even sparked some things that I totally forgot about. Yeah, Man, I, yeah. he really got it good. I can't. Wait. Well, I read them half an hour ago, so you know, it's fresh in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait till uh, Seven Soldiers wraps up, and uh, you know. Y- we got to get your thoughts on that eventually because that's that's such a huge. Oh, I, hey, look, you know, let's get together, and I think we should absolutely have a. Once it's all over, I'll be. I would love to come back and do a whole thing on Seven Soldiers, or you know, we can do a whole. I, I would love to have a conversation, do a whole special on you know, Seven Soldiers, or do little fifteen-minute bits uh, for a couple of episodes on each individual book before some kind of conclusion. But I think we should definitely talk about that. Yeah. I mean, the continuity, and again, Morrison's very he's very clever on on issues of continuity and connection with these things. If you look, you know, he started off on Animal Man. Um, he goes on to do um, to do JLA, and of course, in the very final issues of JLA, guest star Animal Man shows up, uh, and then you know, 
and, and, and in fact, if you look in JLA 1 million, uh, in the background, uh, he's, is the first appearance of the Ultramarines, um, and then the Ultramarines show up in JLA Classified, which is the first appearance of Nebula, who will be the main villain for the Seven Soldiers. I mean, this is all, uh, you know, this is all sort of richly connected in as a little link to each earlier book to make sure that it, it all kind of pulls together. Um, and it's, you know, again, that's that same continuity that I'm talking about with him saving in DC 1 million. It runs all through Grant Morrison's work. It's, I mean, it's very, the connections are, are tight, and they're, they really are there. And that's why you, me, and Shane are, are the ones in this room right now who think that Grant Morrison is the man. That's right. It's, I mean, and Seven Soldiers will be, I mean, Seven Soldiers, I think, is him trumping DC 1 million, right? Because Seven Soldiers, like DC 1 million, is, is, is a revival of a, it's a crossover, right? It's a, it's a kind of hybrid between a team book a standard team book, and a crossover. you got multiple issues, and they all sort of interact, except unlike other crossovers, there's a, you know, again, you were saying that many of the DC 1 million issues, they were throwaway, sort of flights of fancy stories about, well, what would happen if, you know, maybe Superman does this in this particular issue, but it doesn't fit into the main plot. In Seven Soldiers, it, it's so rewarding because every single moment in it is important, and they, the, inner, the connections are, are there on so many different levels, and it's a kind of, it jacks up, it, it's, it's like what a crossover really should be. There should be so many connections between the books so that it's, it's reward. It's the whole idea of the crossover. Right? The whole concept of it is yep. uh, aesthetically, it's supposed to be about it's rewarding that, that you can all. Everybody can can you can. So if you've been reading all these titles, now you see them all come together, and that's the reward. And, and Seven Soldiers has that built into the concept. Cool. I can't wait. I can't wait. It's going to be. I mean, I haven't finished it. So when that rolls around, we'll definitely give you a call. And as our first call-in guest, I have to say thank you. Yeah, you know, that, that was so neat to hear the phone and go, hey, we got a call-in. I, I wish I would have had the volume turned up and so <laughs> we would have actually heard you when I said hello. But <laughs> but we will definitely keep in contact and uh, give a, give another plug for your book. Uh, it's How to Read Superhero Comics and Why. I'm sure that's, uh, you know, available on uh, Amazon.com. I think it's a link to it on uh, TheFuturistMovie.com. Um, yeah, and uh, I, I do appreciate you guys having me, and you know, keep up the good work, and you know, I look forward to uh, talking more in the future. Great, great. All right, well, uh, get some sleep. Yeah, go to bed. <laughs> All right, signing off in England, Jeff Clark. I'll see you guys. Right, see bye -bye. ya. Bye. Bye. Screw getting sleep. Breathe. <laughs> Damn it, breathe. <laughs> he he's great, man. Listening to him talk. Wow, his wow. enthusiasm for yeah. that work is. Yeah, and I, I think I read half of War and Peace while he was talking there. It was just like <laughs> the funny thing is Woo! when I called him, he said, uh, "Oh, I got an hour and a half. Yeah, I'll read it." And and you know, <laughs> yeah, you know, and it, you could read you it could, an hour and a half, but, but you know, he and he said, "I'm going to write some notes." And yeah, you yeah, could tell, so. you could hear him flipping the pages. Yeah. like you knew he wrote yeah. stuff down and everything. So. Yeah, he, uh, he, I mean, we're all enthusiastic about comics, but he, like, he takes it to a whole nother level there. Yeah, now that's a comic geek right there. <laughs> yeah, that's a fanatic. He puts the fanatic in fan as far as Grant Morrison goes. Whew. I think that would be, uh, be John if John was on something. Yeah, as I was much knowledge say, as he, he has in there. If we coke up John Duffy, that would, he, he would come out as, as Jeff. That would, <laughs> that would be for certain. But, so. Uh, while we're in this uh, uh, CGS countdown to Infinite Crisis, um, the, uh, we talked about DC 1 million. That was in 1998. We're going to skip Genesis for now, which is 1997, and we're actually going to go back to 1995 and do Underworld Unleashed. And Brian is actually calling Adam, um, Adam Murdo, who was on our show a few times, uh, tw two times, I think. And um, he also was around during our Crisis on Infinite Earths um, special, uh, and he did a call in, and, and he talked about that for a little bit. And here we go, Adam. Yep. Hey, welcome to the show. Oh, great! Thanks. Great to be here. Hi, Adam. Hey, guys. So, Adam, we just had Jeffrey Clock, who who was on our show before, Jeff Clock before, talk about DC One Million, and uh, and and he's another. You know, he's out there writing books and doing thesis. <laughs> the mm. thesis oh yeah, actually, on. I already have uh, one of his books on hand to write my own thesis with. Which one do you have? Um, how to read superhero comics and why? We just plugged that, and we actually talked about that when he was on our show on episode uh, forty-five. So that's that's awesome. It's like this weird synergy thing going on. Yeah, it's that continuity. It's thing a that continuity he was talking crossover about. thing going that's on. Right. We got some uh, bonus. Seven degrees of CGS. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you got uh, you know five ten minutes. You want to wax ph philosophic philosophical on Underworld Unleashed? Well, uh, I'll give him my best shot. So can you wax philosophical about <laughs> Underworld Unleashed? <laughs> I can sure as hell try. <laughs> I mean, heck, I'm a grad student. I can probably wax philosophical in 20 pages or more on almost anything if you <laughs> so give me enough research time. So, so you're a consummate bullshit artist. <laughs> <laughs> yes, all academics are, I think. I think if you ask Mr. Clock that, he'd tell you the same thing. 
No, no, he tells you that in like twenty minute uh, dissertation. That's what <laughs> I right. tell you. Here we go. All right, so we got uh, Underworld Unleashed. Um, those of you who might not be familiar with this uh, crossover storyline, uh, it happened. I think it's this is actually the tenth anniversary of that story. Now I believe it was nineteen ninety five. You are correct. when it came out the first time. Um, functionally, what Underworld Unleashed was about was a, a good opportunity for DC to sort of dust off some old villain characters that they had and hadn't used for a while that had sort of fallen into disrepair and had achieved uh, what we'll call joke status uh, over time and uh, a succession of writers who just didn't care for them very much. Um, uh, the idea was there was this demon whose name was Neron who came back after a lengthy absence, you know, doing demon stuff, and he came back and uh, he... Uh, somebody say something? No, no, no. You're, we're just opening up some comics. That's probably the noise you heard. Okay. Yeah, I thought somebody was trying to get a word in. No, nope. good. We're going to let you speak. Oh, great. All right. Well, uh, yeah, okay. So D- Neron came back, and uh, he went around and offered uh, to basically every single supervillain in the DC universe the opportunity to boost their power level and their general coolness factor and send them out to get revenge on the superheroes who had been beating and mocking them for the past several decades in exchange for, what else, their souls. It's really an interesting concept, and uh, you know, it appealed to me right off the bat because I've always been a very big villain fan. You know, right back to the days of the Super Friends, the main reason I watched the show was because of the Legion of Doom. So as a chance to see these uh, little-known and seldom-seen villain characters get some of their own back, you know, it's sort of like a showcase for these obscure villain characters and also a chance for DC to reinvigorate them and uh, make them more legitimate threats for the heroes. So from a, a publishing standpoint, uh, the, the story itself was actually a pretty good idea. It, it just made good marketing sense. Um, but even beyond that, uh, one of the things that I like best about Underworld Unleashed is that it was a good, tight little horror story. You know, it, on a certain levels, it really was kind of scary. All right, now, here's where I start to get uh, philosophical on you guys, because I'm going to bring in uh, Freudian psychology to the mix. Um, the story Underworld Unleashed taps into a concept that's called the return of the repressed. And the return of the repressed refers to uh, deep-seated fears that we tend to have, that elements of our culture that we have uh, abused, neglected, exploited, or whatever, are eventually going to come back and bite us in the ass. I was just thinking to myself before you guys called, Underworld Unleashed, in a way, sort of reminds me of John Carpenter's Prince of Darkness. It's a classic horror flick, and it's one of uh, Matt's favorite horror movies. Uh, We watched it together a little while ago. And in that, uh, we have Satan coming back to Earth, and uh, he's able to command the vermin of the Earth to do his bidding, including cockroaches and beetles and rats and also homeless people. Yes, apparently homeless people are considered vermin in John Carpenter's world. Not exactly (laughs) PC, but there you go. And so that sort of played on 1980s American cultural guilt over uh, what uh, the way we've been treating homeless people, the way we sort of uh, marginalized them and treated them as vermin, and it sort of played on our fear that one day they're going to come back uh, with uh, Satan to back them up and kick our asses. Um, Underworld Unleashed has sort of a similar uh, thematic structure there. Uh, Neron comes back, and uh, he employs the vermin of the DC universe to do his bidding. He gets all these poor third-string supervillain types, and he sort of refurbishes them and gives them an opportunity to go out and get revenge on the people who have been treating them as jokes all these years. When you think about it, it's a major theme in a lot of uh, important horror movies that have been made in the past uh, to take uh, things that are largely considered innocent, harmless, or even cute or funny Um, recast them in monstrous form, and send them out to start killing, maiming, or eating people. I mean, look at the Puppet Master flicks, look at the Child's Play movies, look at all the different uh, killer rat or killer bug movies that have been made. The smallest, most insignificant things become downright scary if they're put in a position to do people harm. And that's, I think, what uh, is most impressive about the Underworld Unleashed series. It uh, sort of catches you off guard with these characters that people have been taking for granted as jokes all these years, and all of a sudden they're, they're dangerous, and it's just, it's just downright scary. I mean, I, I point to Killer Moth as the most salient example of that uh, little trend. I mean, uh, he was just a guy in a green and purple bug suit, and all of a sudden he's this giant, salivating, foul-smelling, six-foot, flesh-eating butterfly. And that, that, that's a pretty uh, impressive metamorphosis there. And uh, he's a... He's probably the most visible example of what uh, Underworld Unleashed did. There's also a whole catalog of like 20-odd other characters that were uh, reduxed by this. 
Uh, I'm not going to go into the details there, but uh, a lot of them are still active in the DC universe today and uh, still um, still pretty badass as a result of what Underworld Unleashed did for them. And it brought back uh, Blue Devil. Oh, yes, yes. Actually, yeah, um, unfortunately, um, yeah, I, I think uh, Underworld Unleashed's influence on the Blue Devil has kind of been swept under the rug lately. Right. But right. Uh, I, I kind of pinned that blame on Bill Willingham from uh, Days of, Day of Vengeance. There's a lot of character development in the past few years that he didn't quite pick up on when he wrote that one. And and it was a series about green neon green ink. <laughs> We're flipping so through was. the books right now, and it's just there's so much of that flashy neon green. It's like yikes! Thank God they didn't continue that. Hmm. But for one special event, it was pretty eye catching. Sure. sure. Cool. Yeah. I mean, they are still around. I know Blockbuster uh, benefited from this whole. Uh, you know, making the deal with the devil, and he was very uh, prominent in Nightwing. Uh-huh. Um, the funniest thing just go, goes, it's by Mark Wade and it's written by Howard Porter. Um, I'm uh, drawn by Howard Parter, Porter, excuse me. Uh, That's backwards. <laughs> yeah. Um, the funniest thing is Joker sold his soul for a box of Cubans, which <laughs> is just so insane. It's, it's hysterical. I have to say, I actually never read it. No? No, no. I like this one. I, I thought this one... You know, also kind of didn't have, like, the earth-shattering kind of feel to it. But, you know, what Adam said about vamping up some of your, your, your villains, it, it, some of them didn't stick, but some of them did. And it, you know, kind of made sense. And Neron's been around since then. I can't say he's been a truly exciting character. Mm-hmm. But, um... Yeah, yeah, last time he popped up was in the pages of Richard Dragon. Yeah, yeah. Which, you know, was totally out of left field. Um... But, um, you know, it's not a bad... It's only three issues, and it crossed over in a whole bunch of books, and, and they certainly aren't necessary. You could just read the three issues and be done with it. That's what I'll have to look for them in the cheapier, or borrow them from you. The, um, the crossovers, right. were they in the annuals or in the regular... Regular series. Regular regular series. Mm-hmm. Yep. They had the tilted titles, and, and they all fought, you know, a villain that was, you know, re-energized by Neron, you know, like Major Disaster and Dr. Polaris and all these other ones, so... Um, it, it was a way, it, it, it was another one of those, you know, that unless writers see it and take advantage of it, they're not going to, you, you know, use the ideas that Mark Wade came up with. Um, were, because there were some villains who actually, you know, became a threat after this. So, um, and one of the ways I think it ties to Infinite Crisis going on right now is the obvious Villains United, you know, where all these villains are coming mm-hmm. together and they are becoming a threat. You know, it, if you laugh and you joke about superhero comics, people who don't necessarily read comics, you know, and they'll go, well, all they do is fight. Nobody, there's no consequences. You know, they just fight, go to jail, fight, go to jail, fight, break out, go to jail, fight, you know. Well, you know, n- there's going to be some tension here, you know, with this infinite crisis. There's going to be some actual consequences and there's going to be some fights, but they're going to have some real meaning. So Even just going with that argument, fight, go to jail, fight, go to jail, I always count that to that's what a hero would do. He wouldn't necessarily just kill willy-nilly or do well i met the villains harm. i met the oh, villains oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah that the villains are always going after the heroes but they never really you know they never are serious about it and now they are going to be so cool thanks adam oh sure anytime hey adam uh if you have five more minutes stick around here on the phone because we can pull you in here and uh, you can help to stump the rios here excellent <laughs> well actually what i'm going to do is i'm going to ask a question to peter he can't answer it. We'll see if he can save his ass. How about that? Sounds good. Mm-hmm. All right. I got your back, Peter. If it's more... <laughs> Forget it. I'm not even going to go into it. <laughs> All right. This one is from John Romps in Falls Church, Virginia. Uh, he... Hey, let's go... Question number one. In the Justice League International America series... What was the name of the island Blue Beetle and Booster Gold tried to turn into a tropical resort? Oh, even you, I know you that. Know, even I know that you know this, Adam, right? Yeah, I do. Everybody, let's say it. Cooey, cooey, cooey. Okay, I didn't know it. <laughs> Question number two. In the first appearance of Jubilee in Uncanny X-Men, what did she call the little explosive light things that she was able to create with her mutant power? Uh, I'll take a guess, and then Adam, because I know it's not right. Adam, if you know, you can take a guess or take a swing at it. Uh, I'll say spark, spark, uh, f- sparklers. 
Mm, that's what I was thinking. Fireworks. The answer is articulate quasi-animate plasmoids. Oh, come you on. believe that that... I was going to say, there's no way those came out of her... That, that, those words came out of her mouth. <laughs> hey, I'll take this guy's word for it. Question number three. After First Comics started publishing Nexus in between the Capital Comics and Dark Horse runs, they published a miniseries starring one of Nexus's best friends, Judah Maccabee, a.k.a. the Hammer of God. Mm-hmm. What was Judah's stated profession? You know this, Adam? Um, I have an idea. We'll say it, because I have no idea. Um, I think I remember reading a Nexus comic where he was a professional wrestler. Uh, the answer is freelance adjudicator. <laughs> <laughs> well, isn't that what you do when you're, professional, when you're not professionally <laughs> wrestling anymore? Isn't yes. that what George the Animal did? Yeah. <laughs> well. Passes judgment upon the weak. <laughs> <laughs> Well, cool. We got one out of three, so uh, yeah, that's not so you're boy. safe. This this fans picking out the r- yeah random obscure questions. Yeah, they're going it. beyond like I just know, the big I two. Look, that's the man. kind of crap you ask us in your trivia game. I know. And, and the I don't know. Quasi I don't know if plasmoids. I, would, I don't know if I'd ask oh. that. But. Yeah, what happened? Half my headset just went. Huh? Yeah, we we're suddenly... still there, Adam. Oh, there you go. Yeah, I'm still here. Oh, okay. Remember that happened in the last episode, and you looked it at us strange. Now it happened do, to you, do you guys. Do you guys hear both, we hear both sides? No, well, now we're fine. <laughs> Just oh. must be me and you. I'm going mono now. We're lopsided. Yeah. So, it's your mm. side this time. <laughs> <laughs> well, cool. All Thanks, right. Adam. I'm glad you were yeah. around so we could call in. We'll have to do it again sometime. Oh, yes. Thanks for having me, guys. Sure. Okay. Anytime. Well, uh, we'll talk to you soon then. Okay. All right. Bye-bye. 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 I have to say, what bef- before the headset thing went, um, when we said about Peter asking us questions, the sad thing is they are about the big two, and we still go, oh, my God. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, you want to quick go right back into Top Shelf real quick just to f- wrap it up since we were interrupted? Oh, yeah, sure. Go ahead. I want to give uh, a shout-out to their website. It's www.topshelfcomics, and comics is spelled C-O-M-I-X dot com. It's their Top Shelf Productions. They're based out of Georgia. And uh, really, they gave some great, great stuff. And who is this? <laughs> another guest? It can't be another guest. Should we take the call? It's probably yeah, like my mom. Ahead. Do it. Let's see what happens. <laughs> Hello? Volume? Uh, Hello? 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 Brian? Yes, mom. Yeah, hi. Hi, you're being recorded on the podcast. <laughs> hi, oh, Mrs. D. Sorry. That was Jamie. <laughs> oh. Well, can I call back another time? Yeah, that would probably be good. <laughs> okay. Bye. All right. Bye. It's like when... <laughs> it's crazy. It's like, hi, Mom. You see how she clammed up all of a sudden? Yeah. Oh, I, it, uh, I don't want to talk out loud to people. <laughs> and she thinks she's li- like she's live on the air. There's right. like thousands of listeners. That's listening right. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> Oh, the joys of podcasting. I can't figure out why do I only hear half twist, the... Twist where we're plugged mine, in. Mine are like that too. I don't... Just twist again like we did last summer. Twist again. So, so the, only other, th- the only other thing we haven't talked about real quick while yeah, they're trying cool. to fix that is uh, The Surrogates. It's a, it's a comic book, actually. Oh, that's it's right. Not, you didn't talk about that one. Yeah, it's not a, a graphic novel or original graphic novel or anything. It's The sur- Surrogates, Robert Venditti and Brett uh, Weldelay. And um, it's uh, one of five... So it's a, a mini series. So eventually, I assume it's going to be traded. Um, edited by Chris Staros, who's the the, uh, yeah. the main guy at Top Shelf, and um, it's kind of funny. It's it's a story about. It takes place in the future where people are so bored. Ag- again, they're bored. You know, what's with the future and everybody being bored? That they have these things called surrogates. It's basically another. Pers- it's it's like your clone or or this company builds this you know human for you and you just kind of plug into it and you send it out. Nobody wants to go out. Nobody makes love anymore. They 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 make their surrogates have love. You know nobody wants to touch each other. Nobody wants to communicate. It's all done through surrogates. The funny thing is is as I'm reading it, I'm going, huh, this is like all those people on AOL. You know it's 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 finding connections uh, uh, elsewhere. You can't do it in real life, so they do it either through the internet, and here they're doing it through the surrogates. Um, there's a ver- there's a scene where uh, a policeman comes home and he puts his surrogate away, and or he detaches from it, 
and he wants to i think it's one of the policemen and he wants to be romantic with with his wife and she's like okay i'll get my surrogate he's like no 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 no, us and she's like ew she's like ew no get away and i'm like oh my god so it's a you know it's it's not uplifting so i'm I, i'm kind of interested to see where it goes um the artwork is uh again another one where they have like panels of just washes of color and, and um, yeah, I like it. It's it's dark and kind of creepy, uh, kind of like uh, Alias from from Marvel Comics was, kind of like a Michael Gatos mm -hmm. kind of style. So, hmm. if you like, uh, I'll have to check that out. Yeah. I didn't actually read that one. Let's see, I think there's a synopsis in here somewhere. It's a five issue miniseries, correct? Yes, five issues. Um, no, it's like a they have like these text pages in the back. That kind of help uh, contribute to the story, but it, it's you know it's basically that that whole thing, and there's a murder mystery and and um, that's all the backstory. What's on the back of the comic? The back page. The back page yeah. is it's this is it's a uh, it says share yourself, and it's this man and woman hugging, and it's uh, by the company Virtual Self, which is this is an okay. ad okay. for the story, for the okay. yeah, for the sur people who make the circuits, which is kind of cool. You think it looks like a cologne ad or something like that, but no, it actually has to do with the story. So, again, top shelf, you know, yeah. they put that little extra oomph on it. That's right, because there are no ads in this book. So, and that's that's the surrogates. So that go buy your own surrogate. Yeah, cool. Top shelf. That sounds very interesting. Doing some great stuff. Well, I think uh, we've come to the end. Uh, big thanks to Top Shelf for sending us that uh, stuff. We enjoyed it very much, and hopefully we'll get some more in the future. <laughs> uh, nothing else. You... I'll be stopping by their uh, their booth often. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And John uh, is a... Uh-huh. Who? What did oh. I just say? Chris. Oh, were you just talking? Uh, never mind. <laughs> Check them out. They go. They yeah. frequent a lot of conventions. Chris I'm is sure a very that, nice guy. Yeah. And uh, you can talk to him, and he'll talk to you as long as you want yeah. about his books. I'm sure they'll be in Philly. I'm sure they'll be in New York. I believe I've seen them at every every convention, bigger convention we've gone to. Cool. All right. Uh, if you want to send us an email, you can do so. ComicGeekSpeak at gmail.com. And visit our website at www.comicgeekspeak.com. Uh, if you would like to uh, send us a Geeker of the Day or Stump the Rios, you send them to the above email address. Uh, we're, we're always looking for more Stump the Rioses. Um, big thanks to Bob at GameCircuit.net for hosting the files, and thanks to the guys at UpAllNightGaming.com for hosting our website. Uh, please vote for us at Podcast Alley and subscribe to us using iTunes. Uh, and if you want, you can get a, your very own CGS t-shirt uh, on the swag section of our website. Special thanks to Jeff Clock and Adam Murdo for their excellent call-in, as well as Brian's mom. Yes. <laughs> a sweet shout-out to Mrs. D. Hey, how you doing? Hi, Mrs. D. Oh, man, that's funny. Um, just a reminder that we are brought to you in conjunction with WorldFamousComics.com. And as always, we are uniting the world's mightiest heroes, one listener at a time. See you next time. Bye. Bye.